Dr. Ficillo is an assistant professor of neuroscience here at Penn. He received his PhD in developmental genetics and his MD at the New York University School of Medicine, where he worked with Dr. Gordon Fischel on the mechanisms of cortical interneuron subtype development. And he then completed his postdoctoral work in the labs of Dr. Robert Malenka and Thomas Sudhoff at Stanford University, where he focused on the synaptic basis of autism-associated behavioral abnormalities. Uh, his lab is currently interested in understanding how specific neural circuits regulate behavior and how disruption of these pathways can lead to neuropsychiatric disease. So please help me welcome Dr. Mark Ficillo. Thank you guys for inviting me. This is wonderful. Look at all these people. Um, I'm really excited that there are non-scientists here. It's sort of thrilling for me. We, we talk a lot to scientists, and it's nice to be able to reach out and to, to get some other people interested and involved. So uh, as we heard, this was a wonderful introduction. And, and for me, I think studying autism and neuropsychiatric disease in general is really gonna be, these are some of the greatest challenges that are facing neuroscientists in the 21st century. And I think one of the reasons that is, is because to understand this, we really need to start to bridge that knowledge gap between the molecules that are in neurons, how they come together to form connections of neurons, and how eventually on a larger scale that influences behavior. So this is a really complicated set of issues, and I think this is something we're gonna be wrestling with for a long time. So we don't have any quick, super easy answers here. But and autism, as you heard, is, is actually quite complicated. It's, it's a very heterogeneous disease with motor abnormalities and social abnormalities. And so where do I come about trying to study this? And, and so it was already mentioned that I, I did my PhD training in developmental genetics. And so I'm a geneticist at some level by heart. And, and so for me, this, this idea that autism is highly heritable is very satisfying because it means, oh, maybe we can tackle this. And it, um, should I just use the pointer here, I guess? So this is just a graph to basically show. So if you are a fraternal twin or a sibling and you share about 50% of your DNA, you have about a 12-fold higher risk of, of getting autism. Uh, than the general population. And if you are a monozygotic, so if you're an identical twin, you have 100% of your genome and you have over 100-fold risk. So that's evidence that this is highly um, heritable and that genetic factors are very important. Okay, so that sounds good. We, we should be able to sequence some things and we can really start to make some headway. And this is actually a really interesting slide, which is basically just to tell you all that we have amazing tools right now for sequencing currently that we haven't had available to us for a long time. So this is the price of sequencing. So it costs $2.7 billion to sequence the human genome. Uh, and now basically we can start sequencing entire genomes for under $1,000 or we're getting to that point. And so this is all of the information we can get from that. So we can read the 3.2 billion base pairs that are in the human genome. This is the code that basically instructs all of the cells to make things, and on some level makes us who we are. So you can see there's about 25,000 genes in the human, very similar number in the mice. So it seems like we have a great tool here, right? We, this is a genetic disease. We have the ability to sequence lots of things. Let's go to work, and, and this should all be you know, simple. And here's the first part where it gets complicated. So this is, these are the, the, 20, the 23 chromosomes, basically. And each of these little, you're not supposed to read these, each of these little pieces of font here, this is a different gene that's been associated in some way with autism. And so what I'm saying here is that this is not a Mendelian genetic disorder. And so that's just a fancy way of saying back when Gregor Mendel was studying pea plants and crossing them to understand inheritance, we got the idea when we started studying Mendelian disorders, it's sort of one gene, one phenotype. And Autism is not that way, and actually more broadly speaking, and you could, a lot of what I'm gonna to say today about autism applies to neuropsychiatric disorders in general, they are also not that way. They're very complex in their genetics. And so this is what we have to work with, but there are plenty of smart people that are trying to get at this. And so one thing would be to look at all of those genes. Um, there's, there's a lot of those genes, a lot of the function is somewhat known from one system or another. 
And so here, basically, they've, they've characterized these genes by putative function, right? What do we think they do? And they're color-coded, so these light blue guys up here are synaptic proteins. These guys are ion channels. They pass currents, and these are molecules that are important in intracellular signaling in neurons. And then these guys out here are uh, transcriptional regulators, and the idea is that many of these are actually regulating these other families. So if you kind of just look from 1,000 feet up and, and you try to say, well, what are the commonalities between this? You basically see that a lot of these guys have a role in modulating communication between neurons. And so this is a very schematized picture of what that would look like, but communication between neurons occurs at something called the synapse. And so this is a connection between one neuron and another one. And what you can see, and well, what happens here basically is that an electrical impulse comes in causes these little green vesicles to be released. They go across the cleft, and the signal continues. So it's like almost like telephone or something like that. And, and so this is a beautiful structure, and it seems like a lot of these genetic abnormalities associated with autism seem to cluster somehow in the way this communication is regulated. But synapses are very complicated. And what you're, I'm just showing you one synapse here, but if you look back in the out of focus, there's all of these other cells, and there's so many different types of cells, so many different types of synapses. We get back to that same spot we were at before with the genetic picture. This is sort of almost infinitely complex. And so to help simplify things a little bit, our lab takes a more reductionist approach, and so we work in the mice. And Mice are a great genetic tool. They share somewhere between 95 to 98% of their gene coding sequences with humans, so highly homologous. We can very readily manipulate gene function. This has been for over 20 years now, and the tools are, I mean, we can almost do it. It's so easy now. It's, it's really quite, it's quite amazing. And it allows us, because we can make these manipulations and go in and perturb the system, we can sometimes really tease out cause and effect. So genetically, this seems like a good system to study things, but is the brain similar at all, right? There's mice, there's humans. How are we going to connect these things? So if we peer into a mouse brain and we, we look at a sort of a, a, a view through here, we can see that a lot of the same structures, actually most of the same brain regions are represented in the mouse. Furthermore, the connectivity, so this is looking at the neurons that connect into this part of the striatum from the anterior cingulate cortex here, is the same in a mouse that is, as it is in a human. And it's actually quite amazing to behold. And as you start to zoom in, you zoom into the level of neurons, and you can see this sort of wispy structure. That's sort of the dendrites where those synapses are formed. And as we keep zooming in at further levels, the conservation actually gets to be more and more, such that when we got to the point of doing an EM of synapses between a human and a rodent, all of the stuff looks exactly the same. And, and so, what I want to just give you the flavor for in, in this short little talk is how we use this power to try to model autism disorders in some way and get at sort of the genetic underpinnings of that. So I talked about the sort of two main symptomologies. You see these sort of abnormal motor disorders and abnormal social function. And so the first one that we wanted to look at was sort of the restricted and repetitive behaviors. And so we thought, well, where's a good place to start if you want to look at sort of a motor stereotypy. And so one thing that we thought about was, well, let's look at a learning process, right? When you learn things like playing the piano or riding a bike, that process gets better and better over time. And so that's a place that you form a normal sort of motor stereotyped pattern. Maybe it might just be perturbed in an autistic individual. And so here we took out a, a page out of a very old mouse behavior. This is an accelerating rotor rod. You put the mouse on it. And it starts to spin and goes faster and faster. And each of these is sort of like, you know, he's learning to ride a bike, for example, or something like that. And we do multiple trials. And what you can see is he stays on longer and longer. So this is some form of motor learning, right? Each time he does it, he repeats it, and he gets better. This is just to give you a little sense of what it looks like. This is our little machine that we have downstairs. We've got five of them going at once. We're going to zoom in on this guy here, and it's going really slow at the beginning, so he's just hopping. We're actually not going to measure this. But there's a linear speed that gets faster and faster, and now you can see he's really moving. He's putting his feet down. And if we slow this down now, we can actually capture exactly where he's putting his feet, and we can do this throughout training. And this is basically just that same picture of the rod. Each of these dots is one of his foot placements. 
And I, I just want you to look and see, you can look at the pattern of the placements here and how sort of uneven and spread out they are when they start training and how much more regular they become just after six trials. So we thought that this was pretty cool. And what's even cooler about it is that these are two different mutant mice for the gene Neuroligin 3. These are uh, meant to model humans that have these same mutations, either the knockout mice or there's a point mutant that's very exactly the same as what human, uh, human family has. And what you basically see here is this dark blue line and this light blue line. You see the slope is higher. They are learning on this task faster. And they're doing it because they're stereotyping their motor behavior more um, quickly than the wild type mice. So in that way, they form a more stereotyped motor output, which is something we would have actually expected. And so what's really cool about that is that these are not the only two genetic mouse models for autism that do that. There are about five other ones completely unrelated genetically. Uh, we have no idea whether the underlying neuroscience is really related at this point, but they all show this sort of enhanced learning. And so this is the first of the kind of heavy sledding slides here. I don't want to, don't get lost in any of this. I'll, I'll just take you through the, the simple point. After about three years of genetic work using all the tools available to us in mice, we were able to break that behavior down that I showed you, that sort of enhanced, more stereotyped motor output that they have, to a deficit specifically in this part of the striatum here. And basically, the mutation interrupted a connection between two types of neurons and changed the output of one of those neurons. And so it increased the output of these neurons, and we ended up with a more stereotyped motor pattern. So this is an example of the power of mouse genetics, right? We have to spend time to understand the behavior and really understand that we know what we're looking at there. But then we can use all of the tools that are available to really sort of unpack this and start to understand at a basic neural circuit level and, and the connections between neurons, what's going wrong. So okay, that's, that's a sort of a motor behavior you would imagine, okay, well, can we model all other things in mice or is it really just motor behavior? So the other main one I wanna talk about are the social deficits. These are really quite prevalent and the ones I wanna focus on here are the sort of abnormalities in social emotional reciprocity and just deficits in developing and maintaining relationships sort of captured by these two pictures where you see the autistic child is sort of sitting off in the corner while other people are playing or here the same thing. He's also performing one of these more kind of repetitive motor, patterned motor tasks that goes on. And uh, a hypothesis in the field is that some of this social dysfunction actually stems from impairments in social reward, right? So the idea that when you hang out with somebody, there's some rewarding property to that social interaction. So mice are actually quite social, um, and they communicate slightly differently than we do. They use smell, they use ultrasonic vocalizations, but they are quite social, and we can measure those things. So this is um, taken from some of the old the, the drug literature, this conditioned place preference assay. And the simplest way to describe this is, if I put you in a room where you were having a party and a good time, and the room looked a certain way, and I put you in another room that was sort of isolated and miserable, and then I let you pick which room you would like to be in. You would go towards the one that you had those more associated positive memories. And that's the, how this basically, this assay works. You take mice from their home cage. There's a, there's a divided chamber here. And basically you see, you put them first together with one type of bedding. You put them by themselves with another type of bedding. Each of these is for 24 hours. And then you put them in a cage where there are the two types of bedding, and you see how much time they spend on either side. And so it kind of looks, we video track them from above, so you get these squiggly lines. There's more squiggly lines here. That's an indication that they spend more time on the side that has the cues associated with a sort of social interaction. And work from a friend of mine who's at John Hopkins now, started her own lab, did some beautiful genetic work, again, about three years. but. Um, where she showed that oxytocin receptor function, so this is an ancestral peptide, very important for affiliative social behaviors, also important for parturition, for example. And when she messed with this gene in the dorsal raphe nucleus, in the midbrain, or in that same ventral striatal region, all of a sudden they didn't have a social preference anymore, these mice. And so to kind of summarize these two parts of the story, this shows us how we can take apart these behaviors 
and to start to understand some of the circuit and underlying neural connections that are, that are abnormal. And we hope that that in some way is going to inform us moving forward. Already we've seen just in these two experiments that both the social component and this abnormal motor component seem to, um, seem to be localized in this part of the striatum here. And so, you know, where are we going with this in the future? I'll just one minute left basically now. You know, you might say, well, okay, fine, you're studying all this stuff in mice. Like, how does this translate? Does it translate? And so what the points I would like to leave you with are is that we're really starting to think more and more that neuropsychiatric disorders are disorders of circuits, right? Specific connections of neurons. A lot of those basic circuits are conserved. So striatal circuits in mice have very similar roles in controlling motor output. Amygdalar circuits have very similar roles in fear. And so there's reason to think that this is a smart place to be looking. And we have these incredible tools in mice. So we can look at very specific types of an anatomy, who's connected to who. We can pair that with things where we can start to do some of that sequencing with the anatomy and understand at the molecular level. And then here, this guy with his, I'll wrap up right now, with his little glowing horns here, is how we test function these days in mice. So we use optogenetics. We put in a protein that allows us to control neural activity with light. And so we can manipulate neuronal activity real time. And basically, you know, I think the sooner we get to answering these questions, the better. Can we create hypotheses that can be brought to the next level and tested in people? What are the neural circuits that are vulnerable to disease? How are they altered and how can they be fixed? So with that, I'll take any questions if anybody has. Um, I just, I, I'm not sure if you answered this already, but is there a specific um, um, uh, line of mice that have been identified as having these autistic traits? So it sounds like a simple question, right? <laughs> um, there are many lines of mice right now that people would say are valid genetic models for autism. And that rests basically on the fact that it comes more from the, the human data, right? So they, they come there, they do genome-wide association studies where you see what mutations are linked together with an autistic phenotype. And then people have made those same knock-ins. That we can do really quite easily at this point. That's when it actually starts to get complicated because you take a mouse and there are an infinite number of behaviors that you can run. I showed two. And actually, these two behaviors that I showed are fairly unique. They really hadn't been done in this way. They were both modeled after behaviors that had already existed, but they were not done in that way. And so what you have right now are many people taking these same mice and running a whole bunch of different behaviors on them. And how, th then we get into the question of like, well, what of these phenotypes is actually modeling autism? And I, I don't actually get too much involved. When I first started presenting this stuff, I got more involved with that. I think of it a little bit differently now. I, I try to simplify down to behavioral circuits that I think actually are translatable. So like the regulation of motor output, the regulation of a stereotype behavior, something like social reward, other types of, of goal-directed behaviors. We can do those in mice, and when people have looked, the underlying neural circuitry is actually quite similar. So, you know, to answer your question in a very long-winded way, there are many genetic models for mice right now. And I think part of coming to the agreement about what best captures it is something that the field actually has to work through. Right? What are the behavioral assays that we feel actually are in some way meaningful if there are ones. And I think part of that is going to, you know, the, the reason I said I can't give you a definitive answer on any of this is that some part of how useful this will be for modeling we'll only know in the future, right? So 
if we generate such and such hypothesis that this circuit is screwed up, the real test of how valid that is as a model for a human is to go and look in those patients. And, and you know, we're just not even at that point yet. So on some level, it's going to be a wait and see. Hi. Um, to what degree do you think some of these mutations are adaptive versus maladaptive? Yeah. Um, that's a great that's a great question. So in the context of, of one of these mutations, right, it causes them to do this motor learning task better. Uh, adaptive versus maladaptive. You know, that that's so I, I have a few different, I mean, we can actually talk after because I'll just bore everybody probably, but <laughs> but um you know, I, I think that it, it, it's true. It, it, I, I tend not to think of things like, you know, the, the behavior and whether it's adaptive or not is, it's certainly, I talk about things being altered out of some range of normal, and the context will depend on that. But a slightly different answer to that question actually is that I wonder a little bit if the genetic complexity needed to make us better at our cognitive tasks. So the expansion of sort of the regions of DNA in between exons to regulate transcription more has actually made us more predisposed to these types of conditions, right? So you, you need to make a system more complex sometimes to make it better, but you can make it more complex to the point that it's more prone to break. You know, it's like a fancy European car that you always have to like do something with. And, and so, I mean, those are kind of the ways I think about that. <coughs> If you don't mind asking it at the end, great. Thank you very much, Mark. Yeah, no problem.